That isn't on my list of words I can't say, but you're right. Yeah, all right. Give me another one, darn it. I'm Rick Riordan. I'm Mark Rochero. And we are so excited the sun and the star is coming out at last. Yay. And we're really excited because Nico and Will are finally getting their own book. They get to plunge into Elvis together. I do. Exactly. But not only that, this is a story about a voice that Nico has been hearing that he finally realizes he needs to answer. Okay, so now we're going to play a little game. And in this game, we have some words we are trying to get the other person to guess. They are all related to this book. But in getting the other person to guess it, there are five words we cannot say. Um, I think we can do this. Okay. I'm somewhat confident. We have time. One of these is really hard, I don't know. So, we're gonna put a little timer on the clock. Okay. I'm gonna attempt to get three of these from you. Okay. So, if we're ready, we're ready, ready? I'm ready, let's do it. Okay, so the first is a place in your books that is located, uh, surrounded by water, and it's where they all go to when, oh boy, um, <laughs> where everyone goes, um, there's counselors the, there. Oh, uh, Camp Pathblood. Yes, all right, cool. Uh, this is a character in your book who is not human, and they are the, they are the dad of Nico. Oh, hey, Nico. That was the one that I thought was going to be super hard. All right, so proud of you. All right, never mind, now this one's really hard. Okay, so uh, in the book, a character has an ability that is revealed, and this ability gets a fun name because it comes out of their stomach. <laughs> it comes out of their stomach. Stomach. And it's uh, it's like a big ray of sun light. Uh, yes. Uh, ah, okay. But uh, so, um, what is the name that Nico gives this character? Oh, like a, a, a nightlight. Uh, glow, glow, glow. Yes, but there's another one. Oh no! Uh, it's it's revealed after. Oh, I can't see the character. Uh, uh, I, I messed up on the easy one, naturally. Okay, so I've got uh, my three words I need uh, you to say and the words right. I cannot use to describe okay. them. I'm going to see how we do with word association. Ready? Yes. Okay, let's start the timer now. Hero. There's so many. Jason. Mm. Uh, hype. Demigod. Thank you. Okay. Uh, location. Um, Central Borough. <laughs> oh, dumb me. Now, see, I'd like to say that that isn't on my list of words I can't say, but you're right. Yeah, all right. Give me another one, okay. darn it. Okay, I'll, I'll go to the next one. We're to the third one. We have to keep that in. That's okay. perfect. Okay. <laughs> Cheating? No, okay. okay cheating. Uh, all right, so here, here's the third now that I've already blown it. So, third one. Um, breakfast term in the book. Breakfast term? Like, I can't With do another one. Milk. Cereal? Type? A type of milk? Uh, oh my god. Uh, what do you mean, like the nectar? Uh, what's it you called? Uh, to describe <sighs> certain <laughs> characters. Oh my god. Um, <laughs> do another one. I, it's so close. On the bookmark. Cocoa Puffs. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm the only one that messed up there. <laughs> oh yeah. It's perfect. It's perfect. No, wait, I did say all day don't cheat, and then... Yeah, what do I do? What do I do? I just wait for the cameras to be rolling, wait, what, you what, can't stop me. Central Park, New York, Manhattan, Trees, Port, okay, all right. Yeah, we'll workshop. We'll, we'll get there.
York Times number one best-selling series, including Percy Jackson and the Olympians, which has sold millions of copies throughout the world. Give it up for Rick Riordan. <laughs> So, you would, for instance, get Solace and D'Angelo as Solangelo. Thank you, very much. <laughs> and I see there are many souls here, and they are living, which is very strange to me. <laughs> but I keep hearing whispers. They're even louder than the whispers in my gown. And they're all saying this name right here. Nico D'Angelo. <laughs> Who is this Nico D'Angelo? My child. Uh, <laughs> my favorite character in the entire series. Um, thank you, one clap. Love that. <laughs> Everyone else is like, totally vibe with everything else. Uh, that part. Um, uh, a perfect never done anything wrong in their entire life, ever, at once. Nothing happens to him in the book we wrote. No, no one would ever write anything that would make him suffer. <laughs> Only you get to make that joke. Oh, well, I, I, this I is more really answering the question, I guess, but he's, he's a demigod, he's the son of Hades, and he's been in many of the books, but, but finally we thought it was time for, for Nico to have his own adventure. <laughs> Why? Why give them their own adventure? This is a selfie, I'm right over there. <laughs> uh, I would answer that with, oh, why not? First of all, why not? <laughs> a, thing, I, a thing we talked about very early on with our editor, who we wish she could be here, but, you know. Forget her, forget her. We don't care about her. Uh, was that, if we were gonna do this, Will and Nico needed a book of their own and that they needed to be treated, particularly as other couples had, particularly thinking about Percy and Annabeth, they needed the same level of love and respect and care and building out their story. They needed a novel length version of that. It couldn't just be this, you know, a short story. There's so much to them and so much that hasn't been revealed until now. <laughs> oh, and so much, so much, so much is revealed. Qu question with the art: How many of you have now read the book? Okay, all right. We won't spoil it. <laughs> I keep making eye contact with like the one person I know here, like direct eye contact. Hi, Eric. I love you. So you know, it is. It is. Um, I understand you're a very successful writer. You're famous, no? I mean, what is famous? <laughs> this? But if you're so successful and so famous, why do you need another writer? <laughs> I mean, the picture alone really tells so much of the story. It's a perfect likeness. Yeah. I was looking for <laughs> someone with a question mark over their head. I was like, this <laughs> explains my gender so perfectly. <laughs> I didn't realize that. Last night, last night I made the 
joke, I was like, why am I the back logo? But now I take it back, that is my gender over there. Who knows? <laughs> well, I mean... <laughs> so, I want to know, why this particular one? This, this, this one, here. This yes, one's huge. Yeah. That's a, that's quite the picture, too. This was, this, by the way, this was taken here in Central Park for A Calendar for the Bells by Daniel Clayton, one of the best books. Thank you. Um, it was taken by my friend, my wife, Zoraida Cordoba. We made the mistake of taking this on Valentine's Day, so we thought we were getting married. <laughs> we weren't, and we had to tell everyone we were single. So why, why Mark? Well, I mean, when I started thinking about writing a novel about Nico D'Angelo and Will Solis, I knew that that's something a lot of the readers wanted. It's something that I had kind of set up in the Trials of Apollo. I knew sort of what the story would be, but I really didn't feel like I was qualified to tell the story by myself of two young gay men uh, and their journey together. I mean, I, I kind of felt like I needed to get an equal co-author, a great queer writer who could sort of bring depth and resonance to these characters that they deserve. I was a big fan of Mark's work, um, as was my former editor, wherever she went. Forget her, I said. Okay. <laughs> and we were just really lucky that um, that collaboration happened, and I hope that you'll find that the book is greater than the sum of its parts. It's something that we could only have done really together. And you, tattoo, tattooed one. Tell us your story, your life story. <laughs> the whole thing? Okay. Um, that's Nina LaCour, by the way. She's one of the greatest what? authors of all time. I think that book, We Are Okay, is perfect. Um, so this is me on my debut tour for Anger's a Gift. We came out in 2018. Um, about a week before my tour started, uh, I texted my friend Patrice Caldwell, who used to work at Disney and is now an agent, and was like, hey, I need something to read in between tour stops, something to just wind down at the end of the night. She was like, why don't you read the Percy Jackson books? And I was like, I need one book. <laughs> and her response was immediately, how dare you read the Percy Jackson book? <laughs> so I, you know, I bought the first one, I put it on my iPad mini, and was like, okay, I'll just read this over the next you know, two, three weeks as I'm traveling. And <laughs> did you hear that cackle? Like, it was like a rolling cackle. It reminded it was... me of home in the underworld. Yes, absolutely. And again, four hours later, was done with it. Had not, I was on deadline at the time, had not written a word. Two weeks later, all 14 books that were out had been read. I made mean, it my whole personality. And then, like many of you here, especially as a queer person, as, uh, as someone who strangely has a lot of things in common with Nico, like I was like, oh, you're mine. Like, this is everything to me. This character means everything to me. Um, you know, fast forward till when I believe Tower of Nero comes out, and then I reread the series again in preparation for that, read Tower of Nero, and then I'm writing books, I'm doing my thing, and I am in a hotel at Long Island City writing a Star Wars book. When... Woo! Oh, are you too? Hi. Okay, sorry. Um, and I get this email from my agent that I fully thought was a prank. And then I had to sign the scariest NDA of my whole life. There is an alternate version of my life in which I didn't get this project and I would legally never be able to tell anyone I auditioned for it. <laughs> That's good, yeah, y'all no, react really well. Very good souls, right? Go yes. Very, very good souls. So, you know, I get on this Zoom call and have but wait, to try to- before you go there. Oh, what happened? I no. want to go into your past. <laughs> God. I jumped ahead, I'm sorry, not very good at telling yeah. stories, sometimes, sometimes. This is why we had an editor, rest in peace. Um, <laughs> look, oh, hold on, I gotta stand up for this. This is me at 11 years old, sixth grade, first week of school, I was student of the week, a direct pathway to being gay. Um, <laughs> If you were if you were student of the week or you were in gate, gifted and talented educated, you're you're gay. Uh, but you can even look here, hobbies, hobbies, writing stories, 
I wrote this book when I was nine years old. I loved the Goosebumps books growing up, and so I, was, I wrote 10 of these things by the time I was 11 years old. Um, and we can all also sit here and appreciate, at nine years old, I wrote a book called Stay Out of the Closet. <laughs> Even then I knew, like, I knew. <laughs> This is alternate version Nico if Nico was Mexican. Uh, <laughs> look at, this, this, is, this is punk rock, goth, emo, mar, I mean, I still am to, to, for the most part, but, you know, I was wearing, uh, look at that eyeliner, it's beautiful. <laughs> In many ways, like, this is all, you know, figurative, but in many literal ways, I do feel like I was destined to write Nico. Um, you know, one thing that I would love that I got to bring to this book is that, unfortunately for a lot of us who are queer or non-binary or trans, our childhoods were not great. And I had a really, really difficult childhood, and it is why I latched onto Nico, is here's this kid who's this little wiry ball of trauma, and I was like, that's me. I know this. Um, and getting to write that character and getting to have this experience early on, even, I remember, well actually, let me not jump ahead, I'm jumping ahead of a story. I think there's a thing coming up that we could talk about. Well, tattooed one, you have shared your background. I appreciate it, I love the stories. But you, mister, do you have something embarrassing to share as well? I doubt it. <laughs> I mean, I don't know, you know, it's a look. Can we, can we change this presentation in the future, future so that Carry On Wayward Son starts playing? And <laughs> well, anyway, we are getting distracted. Let us go back to the process. What was the audition like? Terrifying. <laughs> I get this Zoom call with, you know, with Rick, um, with this person we don't, I don't remember her name anymore. Um, sometimes if I, Get real quiet, I can hear her still speaking. It's weird. Um, it's weird. It's weird. She, I think she's still with us. Um, and so I was still asked, hey, we want to see sort of like a sample. What do you think the beginning of this book would be? Uh, if some of you out there were lucky enough to get that chapter sampler, it was about five chapters long. Um, I revealed this on Twitter not too long ago. You actually are reading the edited final version of my audition. Like literally up to that scene, that's what I turned in. Um, and so. You know, I get this outline, we're gonna talk about it in a second, but I was like, oh, I, I want you to know how ready I am to write for the series. Those are, that's partial reread of the series. All of those sticky notes are a different thing. I will reveal it on Twitter when this tour is over, but there's a reason what those colors mean. I had a whole color-coded thing with every instance of Nico, Will, other characters who are in this book. I don't wanna spoil who show up, I showed off. I use this uh, program called Plotter, P-L-O-T-T-R. It is a visual means of writing an outline. This is my outline for Into the Light. This is my outline for You Only Live Once, David Bravo. And my thing is I wanted to show like, oh, I'm ready. Like I'm ready to be, do this in detail. You are not just asking someone to write a book who like might have a gay thought every once in a while and you're like, okay, it's on the page. I was like, this is what I do. Like I prepare a lot. And it, it worked out really well because Rick is an outliner it, it, oh yeah, I love, I love this, and I love colored sticky notes. That was like my thing. I don't even know if these are actually corresponding to anything, but they were so impressive. They weren't. Oh my god. <laughs> what if I just said this and it's all been a scam? Oh, wow, wow. Well, it worked. Another question. There was an outline like these. this. Is Did a... anything get added to the original outline? Uh, well, the outline was 11 pages. The book is 480, so a few things, just a little things. Um, this is the outline that I wrote to start with, and I, I really, it's just sort of going from place to place. They do this, they do that, they meet this monster, they meet this person, this happens, that happens. There was a lot to be added, so after this outline went to Mark, yep. they did a second outline, went back to, I don't know why I'm looking at you and I'm thinking of Stephanie, but God rest her soul, came back to me and went back and forth, and then yes, we added quite a bit. You're forgetting a person who's a part of that process. <gasps> yes, I am. Yes, Becky Reardon. <laughs> she was very, very instrumental in how this book ultimately 
turned out, which for me as a Percy Jackson fan was so delightful, because I remember getting a version of the outline back, and I was like, I saw the first like comment from Becky Reardon, and I was like, no, it's not Becky. And then like as I'm reading, I'm like, oh, this is Becky. Oh my God, this is amazing. Oh, her point is so good, and she helped in particular with Will. Will is the way he is in this novel so much because of her gentle nudges and suggestions. Because for me, that was the hardest character to write in this book. I knew Nico inside, I mean, I could write Nico with my eyes closed. I did have my eyes open a lot in this book. <laughs> but yeah, um, to answer your question, Gorgaira, part of what was fun about this was that Rick and his team and Disney let me do what I wanted. And as a queer writer, and as someone who has dealt with you know, all the institutional issues in publishing, to just sort of be let free in, like, you know, they talk about you're playing in someone else's sandbox. No, I was in like Toys R Us. And I was like, have fun, go off. And then no one checked on me for like a month. It was great. <laughs> I built my own society. I built a lot of Legos. We, um, I, I, there, so I don't want to spoil. The first thing you'll get to that was not in the outline is the flashback. And I remember writing the book and being like, I kept running into this problem with Nico and Nico having to constantly explain to Will what Tartarus is. And then I had a moment where I'm like, I am telling way more than showing. I think I need to show something. And I did not tell uh, Stephanie Lurie, rest in peace, uh, or Rick that I was gonna do this. And I just swung with wild abandon and was like, I'm gonna come up with something. So that, would, that was not planned and I, it's, I think it's an integral part of the book now. Yeah, I mean, this is the most achronological book, I think, in Percy Jackson's yeah. work, in that it flashes forward, it flashes back. You kind of have to keep track of where you are. Uh, but I think it's richer for that. I mean, it's, it's, it's got so many different levels to it, and you learn about Nico and Will's individual past, their past mm -hmm. together, uh, but you're also hearing stories that are told, funnily enough, to Gorgyro. So there's that piece, too. I love and I love monsters. Many of these are my friends from oh, the underworld. Yes. Some are from Tartarus. And one of them is me. How nice. Where did these come from? Why you pick these? Well, I mean, a lot of these uh, are from various places in, in Greek mythology, different stories. Some, like the Sinocephali, you have seen before in other Percy Jackson books. Others are pretty novel. Uh, Mark, tell us about your favorite. Oh, I love this Let's story. Go. Let's go. I gotta stand up for this one. God, First good. of all, I never like, you know, well, so many, uh, many of you have the book. You have the special Barnes and Noble edition that has this poster in the back, which is really cool. Um, and I've never like just sat and examined this and like, Menuhides is so butch. I'm so excited. Okay, anyway, uh, sorry. So, my favorite contribution probably to the entire book, which also was half in the outline, but half not, <sighs> the Eternae. When I was a kid, you know, I was, like many of you, obsessed with Greek mythology, and I was lucky enough to have a history teacher who introduced me to the journals of Alexander the Great, and there's a lot of really weird stuff in those journals. So we were learning about where he was going, we were tracking it on a map, and there was a story when he was in somewhere near northern India where he came across these creatures called the Eterne, who were these weird, woolly-skinned, sort of like an elephant, sort of like a bear, but they stood upright. But the thing that stood out to me is they collected bones on their head. And they had these gnarly bones sticking out of their head. And of course, I'm eight years old and in the closet, so I hyperfixated on this and was like, this is my whole sense of self. And I was like, oh, I can't wait to read more about these things in other books. That, yeah, they don't ever, I think they show up in one obscure video game. No one writes about them. So I have literally been sitting here for 30 years <laughs> being like, when can I write about the attorney? And so the attorney got added to the outline. They were definitely were in the outline. But the problem is when I started writing them, they are these horrifying creatures with red eyes and like these bones jutting out of their head. And so the first draft of the scene was so scary, it actually wasn't fun anymore. I was like, oh, I think I've gone full into horror. So I was really struggling with what to do. And I was sitting there and I, you know, 
I learned so much from writing from Rick. And I, I had gone back to some earlier action scenes and was like, one of the great ways to deal with something really scary in the Percy Jackson world is to tell a joke. And that a joke can cut the tension but not negate it. And so it was a thing I learned about writing from Rick. And so I was like, what would make this scene better? What if they were himbos? <laughs> so that's all I'm gonna say, but you're gonna get to the scene. You will know in one second. And it's a lot. Will definitely thinks they're hallucinating the whole time. It's great. But I love getting to do that and to learn from you and to contribute something to the Percy Jackson world that I felt was like my homage to it and, and my attempt to write like you. Like, and I love that we got to learn from each other in, in creating these things. Yeah, I mean, you've made Percy Jackson canon now that just, you know, you have. I mean, not just the monsters, but backstory uh, of, of Nico and Will and a lot of the other characters. It's really incredible. And one thing that I've learned from you um, is just the kind of the chance to let the emotions breathe and let, let them experience them. It's been really, really gratifying um, because you, you do that so well. You, you give the characters a chance to explore how they're feeling about things. And sometimes I'm so concentrating on, you know, pace, 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 that I don't do that. So I learned equally as much from you. I love the romance. It fills my soul. But what are these scribblings in the front and the back of the book? Okay, um, so uh, these are, yeah, this is the, the, okay, this is the final version. Sometimes I don't know. Um, in your end papers of the books. That was rude comment, how dare you? I'm sorry, you just wait. The end papers have this uh, journey that uh, Nico and Will take throughout uh, the, the underworld. Um, but we didn't just get this from nowhere. Um, I, well. Oh, no. Yeah. <laughs> So you're very lucky in that the town hall produced these wonderful playbills for all of you. So lucky. Because this is in it. <laughs> I get an email um, from the dear and departed Stephanie Lurie, rest in peace, that was like, hey, I think you were actually on set at Vancouver, so it was literally impossible for you to sit down. But they were like, oh, we we're thinking of doing these end papers with a map. Do you want to just sketch up a real map? And I was like, no, um, no, I don't draw, that's not a thing. And Steph had said, what well, does it need to be good? And in my head, I was like, it won't be. <laughs> I mean, this is someone who, when I got with Rest in Peace BEA book on, my first book on here at the Javits Center, that labyrinth, that's actually the inspiration for the labyrinth in Proceed Right, isn't it? That Pretty much. Sense. Makes sense, yeah. um, where I once signed a book for a kid, gave it back to them with a doodle, they asked for a doodle of a cat, and they looked at the doodle and then looked back at me and said, you should stick to writing. <laughs> So that's my level of art. So I was like, well, I know the main plot beats and it, I just needed to give an idea for the person who drew the end papers. Let's take a journey through this nightmare. We've got, okay. Katie's Palace is the accurate. This just says, ah, oh, suffering. Um, more suffering that apparently only happens to Will, I guess. Um, um, let's, oh God, what is happening up there? Will regretting everything, that's up here. My favorite is, this is Menoides, the real butch from last time. This is what I drew as Menoides. And I just put, please don't judge. Uh, I'm a, I, there's a lot. So please look at the playbill, you'll get to see the original draft of these end papers that thankfully got turned into an actual professional work of art. Now I have the most pressing question of all. If you do not answer this correctly, I will not let you leave tonight, so be careful. I think they'd be fine with that, actually. Yeah. But, yeah. Do you have a favorite part? Oh. Do I have a favorite part? I, I do love Persephone's garden. I had sort of imagined this, this scene one way, and then you made it so much better. Uh, it was really fun to see Nico and Will in that environment. Um, I especially like the part on the map that you drew where it says, Persephone, imagine she is pretty. <laughs> <laughs> right, yeah. 
I couldn't, I couldn't yeah, do that. I think you, so. You, I think that would be a great tattoo, actually. Somebody, I don't know. I'll get that. I know that. Yeah. How, what, what was yours? Um, I have two. One is the things Menowinis reveals. Uh, Menowinis, it, it, it's great. I was really happy. So a theme that appears throughout this book is that no one is who you think they are when you first meet them. Um, and even Nico and Will learn that about each other, that even after knowing each other as long as they have, there's still more to be learned. Um, I enjoyed writing that, but my favorite part from you is a joke from a troglodyte that wasn't in a draft I, that you came up completely with. And I remember getting your draft back and I laughed until I cried. It's so great, I'm not gonna say anything else, but you, you really fleshed out the troglodytes and gave them so much wacky humor and helped build out this society even more. So I loved, because that's the thing is, is when, when it really comes down to it, there's very few things in this book. Why am I sitting like this? What am I? <laughs> I'm gay, that's why. Like, we can't sit in chairs, sorry. I did this last night too, and I was like, I will sit normal tonight. I did. Um, but like, we, we, people have been asking us in interviews and whatnot, like, oh, who wrote this part? Who wrote this part? And, Almost everything is really half and half, where like you may came up with the idea, but then I came up with one way of it came out, or I came up with something, but then you found a different way. And so, you know, I loved that experience of writing this. It's like getting drafts back from you, and I, it was like I got to read a new Nico book every single time, because I didn't know what was going to be in there. Um, so, you know, my favorite part was doing this with you. And, and I have to say, I mean, you've added so much. Like, I, we're still kind of adding to canon. I mean, last night, I think you said that Minoades was a Swifty, right? Yeah. And then, yeah. Sure, he's got like the set list tattooed on his back. No, he has the lyrics to the 10-minute version of All Too Well on his back. Oh, there it is. There it is. And I really think that has to be canon now, you know? That's, that's good. The, well, but the, per, the Persephone scene is where a certain character's sexuality is finally put on the page, which was really important to have that spelled out. And then I forgot that I did that, and then I said it on Twitter, and everyone got set on fire. Like, everyone was like, wait, what? That's in it? And I forgot. Like, so, I'm learning. No, Sorry, yeah, you, yeah that, was, that was totally Mark. I mean, like, laying down the canon, you know, from on high. And it was awesome. Okay, I, I love that visual metaphor. Like, I'm just up on a mountain, like, yeah. and this is canon, and now you're gay. Like, <laughs> it was great. I but, it. This collaboration was so much about each of us being like, well, here's the thing I know I'm really good at, and then leaving space for the other person to fill in what we maybe were uncertain about, or what, what gave us trepidation, so that, you know, like you said this multiple times in the past week about like, this really feels greater than the sum of its parts. And we're really proud of that. Absolutely. Well, this has been fascinating. But you, mister, you are a very busy man, no? You have many other things to tell us about? I guess I... <laughs> wow. That is, it does look like a lot, doesn't it? I, we had that moment where we were both shot, like I was like, it's so loud. <laughs> Yes, sure, yes so there's a lot of that. Um, sure, I mean, I could talk a little bit at first about um, the imprint that we do, Rick Riley Presents. Which, I mean, if you're not familiar with the imprint, basically the idea started with people asking me, Rick, would you ever write uh, a sort of a Percy Jackson type book on Chinese mythology or Aztec mythology or whatever it may be? And there's lots of wonderful mythologies out there in the world, but I'm not an expert on all of them, and I didn't grow up with all of them, and I didn't really feel like I was the right person. So I started talking with my fine friends at Disney and saying, wouldn't it be better if I could just sort of put the spotlight on authors that are actually from these cultures and grew up with these, let them tell their own stories, and I'll just be the truth. So, Thankfully, um, they love the idea, and we found some amazing authors to tell their own stories. I don't tell them what to write. I don't say, hey, you gotta make it like Percy Jackson or what, you do your thing. 
The only thing I say is if you like Percy and you like mythology stories, you like action and humor and all of that, you're probably gonna love these stories too because all of these authors do that their own way. So it's done wildly, wildly better than I ever thought would be possible. And we still have so many more books coming out. A few of those, just to put on your radar. This one is out now, Stacy Lee. Winston Chu versus the Whimsies. It's based in San Francisco and it's based on Chinese folklore. It's fantastic. Also, coming out over, I've been a fan of Daniel's writing for years. He does everything. He does YA, he does adult stuff, he does middle grade. He debuted our first young adult title for the Rick Riordan Presents imprint. And the second novel in the duology, the Outlaw Saints novel, The Last Canto of the Dead, comes out very, very soon, May 16th. It is fantastic. It's based on a lot of things, but uh, in large part on Cuban Santeria. Really, really interesting world he's created. Also coming up, <laughs> oh, Gracie. Gracie Kim is so amazing. I still have never met her in person. She lives in New Zealand. So, you know, we communicate, but I've, I've never met her. But she writes this wonderful series that is set in Los Angeles. It's about Korean folklore and mythology, fabulous stuff. It will make you so hungry for Korean food. The recipes that she puts in there, oh my goodness. And the, the third book is coming out June 6th. So definitely, if you haven't started it yet, check out that. Ah, Mesopotamian mythology, one of my favorites. Sarawak Chata does it amazingly. His second book is coming out in August, Fury of the Dragon Goddess. It's got everything you would want from Babylon and all the Mesopotamian gods. So cool. The second book just got a star review. That's really rare. Second books in series don't usually do that. But check it out if you haven't. She started the Rick Riordan Presents imprint with her Aru Shah series about Indian mythology. Did an amazing job with that. And what you might not know is that the other half of Rasha's heritage is Filipino. And here, she gets to delve into Filipino mythology for the first time. I never thought I would read a Rash book that I liked better than Aru Shah, but I don't know, the Spirit Glass may be my favorite book she's ever written. It is so, so good. So look for that coming in September. Yay, Rosie! And Rosie Brown writes a series uh, about Ghanaian mythology, Ghanaian vampire hunters in modern America, but these aren't just any old run-of-the-mill vampires. No, no, no. These are West African vampires that are way more interesting and way more deadly. And you have to know a lot to, to survive these. So if you haven't checked this out yet, the first one is out, it's amazing, and the second one is coming out September 12th. <laughs> Another one of our debut authors, J.C. Cervantes, has been doing incredible things with Aztec and Maya mythology. And she is still going strong. This is the Shadow Bruja series. The newest one comes out October 10th, Dawn of the Jaguar. Oh. And Yoon, Yoon Hami. I love Yoon series so much. I, it's hard to describe. It's kind of like Star Wars with Korean mythology. It is so great, magic and sci-fi all in one product. And the, the third title in the series is coming out in October. And a lot of you have asked me about this over the years. Where are graphic novels for the rest of these Percy Jackson books? Well, we heard you, and they are coming. So the graphic novels for the, the rest of the Heroes of Olympus series are in the works. Robert Vendetti is the storyteller, and Orpheus Collar is the artist. And these are coming out September 26th. I think they look dynamite. I hope not. So. 
Yeah. So, uh, a question I've been asking a lot over the last few years. Seriously? Um, Hollywood, what can I tell you? So, about two and a half, three years ago, um, we heard that Netflix was just kind of out of the blue. They, they called us and one of the executives said they really were interested in optioning the Kane Chronicles. Yeah. But um, as you may or may not know, I, I have had experiences with Hollywood before. <laughs> and for about 10 years there, I was like, never again. <laughs> not going there, never. Uh, but I, I, I talked to Becky about it and we were like, well, I mean, there are some opportunities here. Maybe if we go out there, we could also talk to Disney about Percy Jackson. <laughs> So we said, okay, we're gonna give it one more try. So we went out there, and the first thing that happened was we met with the Netflix folks, and they were so excited. I told them, you know, if we do this, we have to do it right. Uh, they wanted to make a feature film based on the first Kane Chronicles, The Red Pyramid, and I said, okay, if we do this, that's, that's fine, but we need to be executive producers, we need to be in the whole thing all the way through, you have to promise me that. And they said, yep, no problem. So where we are now with this project is we have been through uh, four or five drafts of a screenplay, which I'm told is not unusual. This takes a long time. But for two years, we've been working on this with different writers, sort of trying to get it in the zone. We now have what we think is the final script, and it is with the studio now. anything else can happen. And then if they like it, then they will buy it, then they'll make it, and we'll see. Also, Daughter of the Deep, my homage to Jules Verne with Anna Dakar, a descendant of Captain Nemo. It was so fun to do this. I mean, it's so different than anything I'd written else. This is now with Disney Plus as a, a streaming feature. So we're developing it to be a movie on the Disney Plus channel. I am writing the script along with Aditi Kapel, who's a wonderful, wonderful writer, and uh, she knows a lot more about the screenwriting side than I do. So together, we're kind of collaborating, and we just turned in the manuscript, I say manuscript, the script, <laughs> to the studio, like the day before the Writers Guild went on strike, so. <laughs> Jackson and the Olympics. I cannot believe where we are with this after struggling and struggling and struggling some more and working some more and years and years and years. Somebody wrote me this morning and they said, you announced this in 2020. Where is this program? It's like, you're seeing it unfold in real time. This is how long it takes to get all these things done. But we have now finished filming for season one. We are doing Actors Leah Walker and Aria, they are so great. They know, they know how seriously you guys want to, this show to be good. And they are working so hard and giving it everything they have. It took us six months to film the first season, and I didn't know, you know, really much about filming, but that's a long time. Uh, they really worked a long time. I have seen cuts of each of the eight episodes. Now, these are really early. No special effects in them. You know, none of the lighting, the music is all temporary music. So they're not finished by any stretch of the imagination, but my first response when I saw the season was like, relief. Thank you. Uh, a funny thing happened.
happened on the way to the adaptation process. I was trying to convince Fox, who is now part of Disney, who did the Peter Johnson movies, who, <laughs> that they're now part of Disney, so they should give the rights over to Disney proper to make the Percy TV show, and meanwhile, all the executives are going, Percy Jackson, what is that? What is that? Do we own that? Do we own that? One of them looked at me and said, who publishes those? And I said, you do. <laughs> but we finally, finally convinced them that this would be a good idea to do a TV show. On the road to that, though, I said, look, if you guys are up for this, maybe I can write new Percy Jackson books. I mean, <laughs> I haven't done it since, like, 2009. I mean, I'm talking, like, actual Percy Jackson novel with him as the narrator, Annabeth Grover, the whole thing. <laughs> So, even though I didn't need to, I decided, you know what, things are looking so good, we got this series coming out on television, this is kind of just a celebration. This is a classic Percy Jackson novel, The Chalice of the Gods, it's coming out in September, and here the great world-ending quest is to get Percy into college. <laughs> We'll see. But. So, for many of you, you are meeting me for the first time, but this is not, uh, Sun and Stars, not my first book, it's actually my seventh. Um, <laughs> I'm very proud of that too. Thank you for raising whatever, I can't see what that is. I hope it's not a weapon. It is a weapon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, I've been publishing for five years. This actually turns five years old in like, two or three weeks. Uh, my debut book is Anger is a Gift. Uh, it won the 2019 Schneider Family Book Award. It is a book about protests, about a group of kids who stage a walkout at their high school. One of their friends is injured by a metal detector. It is near and dear to my heart and about my high school experience. If you like things more on the fantastical side, my second book, Each of Us a Desert, is a secondary world. Thank you. Four of you have read it. It's a secondary world fantasy about a girl who has the magical ability to pull stories out of people's bodies and she's told she's not allowed to leave town because she needs to cleanse everyone around her or else her god will get vengeance on her. And one day a stranger shows up in her town and reveals accidentally that everyone has been lying to her. Um, <laughs> can I just have you all around her react to everything I say? I love it so much. Um, I also write middle grade. I have two original middle grade novels. Uh, the Insiders. <laughs> around one joke, which is uh, about a queer kid ending up in a closet while running away from his bullies and being like, oh, I'm in a closet. Um, and it is about this kid, Hector Munoz, who finds a magical closet on his campus that allows him to meet up with two other kids in two other parts of the country in a pocket universe that helps them not only escape their bullies, but then starts forcing them to solve each other's problems. You Only Live Once, David Bravo is my... travel novel about the most indecisive kid on the planet who is forced to travel back in time to redo his greatest mistake, but when he does that, he breaks the world a little bit, so he has to keep going to an earlier point in time to find out where he went wrong. This probably has my favorite plot just of all time. My most recent book is Into the Light. Thank you. And look, I know author, and I'm sure you get this answer all the time too, like, oh, what's your favorite book? And it's, you know, they, people are like, the authors, we, we say like, hey, these are all my kids. I don't like favoring any one of them. I love them the most. That's my favorite child. Like, right there. <laughs> like, I love this child so much. Uh, Into the Light is a largely, un unfortunately, autobiographical story. Um, I wrote about my experience um, with homophobia as a kid and being kicked out of my house for being gay. Uh, but it is a thriller about two kids whose lives are intertwined because of a religious camp. One of them attends it but cannot remember his past and is always told he's a miracle, and the other kid is trying to find the camp in order to find out if the dead body found outside of it is his sister who was instrumental for getting him kicked out. And I'm very proud of it. Um, so that's a little bit about me if you want to check out my other work. Favorite time. It's question and answer time. <laughs> These questions came 
from some of the souls. We, we don't know what they are, actually. Oh, we were not allowed to look at them, so I'm afraid. <laughs> this is for both of you, Minster and Tattooed One. <laughs> Can you tell us why it is important for kids to read and learn about Greek mythology? Well, uh, I mean, the first thing that comes to mind is that it's everywhere, and once you know it, you start to recognize how many different facets of popular culture it has influenced. I remember being in Dublin like 10 years ago, and I, I, was, I was doing an interview with somebody. I said, well, why Greek mythology? We don't, we don't have any of that here in Ireland. And I walked out, and I was walking around St. Stephen's Green, and there's, oh, look, look at that building, there's Hermes. <laughs> yep, there's Zeus. Oh, oh, there's Athena. They're everywhere. You can't get away from Greek mythology. And I, you don't have to know it, I suppose, but if you do know it, you start seeing that, that sort of archetypal story everywhere that you look. And it just it makes everything a little richer, I think. My favorite thing about it, too, and why I liked it so much as a kid is just the power of the storytelling. And I still love it because it helps me think about how to tell stories now. Um, you know, a common advice we give to, you know, to young readers, to young writers in particular, is the best practice is writing and reading and to read stories from around the world, see how they tell stories, how are they different. So there are ways that Greek mythology and those classic stories are told that we still cling to, but then some that we don't. Um, in the way that the action rises and falls. And so I, I always say, like, reading a story is a lesson. It's a lesson on how you can potentially tell a story, too. And as you're saying that, I'm starting to think that one of the reasons Greek mythology has been around for so many thousands of years is that it's kind of like what we were saying about the outline. It's almost as interesting what is not explained as what is explained. And those stories are so strange. And they make you think, they don't answer all your questions. Why did he do that? What was she thinking? You know, what, what? It came out of where? And there, there's so many strange things about Greek mythology. You know what I'm talking about, it is terrible. But it's, it keeps us interested. <laughs> I don't know what you're thinking about, I don't know. You, mister. When you first wrote Nico D'Angelo, did you know how much of an impact he would have on queer kids? No, 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 I didn't, I didn't. I mean, I, I knew Nico was a great character. I loved him. I thought he was amazing ever since uh, he first kind of came into the fictional world. Um, and just as a son of Hades, I mean, right there, you know, that's a cool factor you can't deny. He's, he's amazing. But the more I got to know him, I guess by the time I was writing The Battle of the Labyrinth, um, it became clear to me, oh, oh, he's a gay young man. And he's kind of, okay, you know? It's like, no wonder, all right, this explains so much and why, you know, all the struggles that he goes through would be, you know, awful for anybody, but especially for a gay young man being from <laughs> 1930s Mussolini's Italy? You know, are you kidding me? You know, he would have so many internalized, uh, you know, so much internalized homophobia for one thing and just, not really knowing how to accept himself. And so it, it suddenly made sense to me that that was a story, that was his story, and part of um, what he needed to kind of express. But no, I had no idea that, that uh, it would be a touchstone. And I'm so glad it has been. I want to add real quickly, well, first of all, thank you, it's amazing to hear that. Um, I, I also want to say that this is not me also trying to make the point of maybe you shouldn't have hired me for this. But one thing I love about hearing you say that is first of all, how many of us in this here can know exactly what you're talking about. And, and the fact that you were able to sort of latch onto that. Cause like anyone here who grew up queer, like we kind of figured it out cause we all got lost in the 80s. It's just called heteronormativity. Um, but, 
I remember reading the first version of that outline that you that sent even before we had our Zoom meeting, and just there are things in this story that are that are one hundred percent Rick that I was like, I have to do this because I know it's going to change queer kids' lives. So you do have an amazing sentiment of empathy and being able to understand what a lot of us have gone through. And I think that is why Nico has had the impact that he has on all of us. Well, thank you. Speaking of Nico tattooed one, is Nico a My Chemical Romance fan? So I hope there are some old school, like emo, punk rock, hardcore kids in here. Because I got to do a thing which is, you know, he's always in a Skull t-shirt, and there's a very famous AFI t-shirt. I mean, AFI is my favorite band of all time. And there's this very famous East Bay Hardcore shirt with a skull, so I just wrote it in and was like, this will get cut, and it didn't. <laughs> and so I actually think what's, there is so much pop culture in uh, Percy Jackson that I loved inching him a little bit towards that, because we all know he is. The answer to the question is, of course, he is. You know, he's into everything Gerard Way has ever done. He absolutely had a crush on Frank Iero. Like, man. See the Frank Iero's new band, Ellis Dunes, they're great. Okay. Yes, 100%. Who asked that question? I, I adore you, we're best friends. All right, we have time for two more. It's so sad for Kogaira, because she could go all night. But anyway, for both of you, which character of all the heroes of Olympus reminds yourself of you? <laughs> I'll start with Nico is the obvious one, but I do want to actually add a second one. But Nico, in many ways that I've talked about all night, um, but I'm also going to add Hazel. <laughs> That's all I'm gonna say. I can't say some other things, but anyway. Hazel. Hazel. I mean, I, you know, it's, it's kind of not surprising, but I gotta say Percy, just because Percy is, You know, he's, he's in, in many ways my alter ego. His voice is a lot like my voice. And I just relate to him so much. Plus, he's just so hopelessly clueless at all times. <laughs> and he's a great guy, but it's like, he just walks into the room and says, like, what are we doing? <laughs> you want me to kill what? <laughs> and I just, I, I feel like I would be that guy. I don't think I'd be that brave. But... All right, one last question no. for both. No. Advice, <laughs> advice for young writers who want to know if they should follow their dreams. Yes. <laughs> and one way to follow your dreams is, first of all, whatever you're creating now, we'll just, let's do art in general too, don't throw away the stuff you're creating now. You know, I wrote that Goosebumps book when I was nine and I still have it. The first novel-length manuscript I wrote Oh, I was 18, 19 years old, rejected by everyone. It ended up becoming The Insiders and You Only Live Once, David Bravo. It took 15 years for me to figure out how to write it. You may not know how to make the art you want that's in your head when you're younger, but as you practice and get better, you might figure out how to finally do it. So don't throw away any of the stuff you're creating now. Yes, you might cringe when you look at it, but we all cringe at everything who cares, you know? Um, that, and then it is really just comes down to practice. And it is okay if the practice isn't good. I think there's this idea of perfectionism, that everything you have to write has to be perfect. And I think a thing we've learned too is what a great collaborative process is, not just working with someone, but working with editors, copy editors. There's all these people who, are, who will eventually be on your side to help you make the things you're making even better and bring these great stories out. So just practice and it's okay if it's not good. Yeah, all of that. Um, I mean, I usually tell people there's three things that it really boils down to. One is to read a lot, 
because that's where you're going to find what kind of story appeals to you. Analyze why these stories appeal to you, what is it about them, how characters are created, how dialogue is done. There's a million different styles of writing out there. Find what you love and figure out why you love it and you're, you're on your way. Second thing is to write a lot. Like Mark said, it is a sport. If you don't practice, you do not get better. Um, there's only one way to get better and that is put the words on the screen or on the paper. And don't worry about it and don't give up. That's the third thing. Don't get halfway through something you write and say, no, this is too hard, I'm gonna start a new one. We've all been there, we've all done that. My journals from when I was 13 are filled with half-finished short stories. Don't stop halfway through, let it be terrible. It's okay, just finish it. And then you can go back and revise all you want, but finish what you start. And I think if you don't give up, that's, that's a big indicator that you have what it takes because all published writers have one thing in common, no matter how different they are, that is we didn't give up. Well, thank you. I still do not know your names, but you have <laughs> filled my heart. You have made me less lonely. And now Gorgara can go back to the underworld and sit there all alone waiting for her husband who's actually a raver. <laughs> Good night. But I think before um, we go, yeah. or, do, shouldn't we get a, a picture maybe? Yes, yeah. we have yeah. books, right? Are there books? Do you guys okay. have your oh, books?